Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Here with another Geek Gal. We've been waiting a long time for this. I'm good at this. Every other month while I'm trying to get through the book is is working for me. I get my willies out. Uh, you know, we sort of feed the the crowd, uh, keep everything working, and, uh, and I'm trying other topics on. So it's fun. But the book is still taking priority, and it's a ton of work. Yep. So uh, I can't wait to talk to you about this stuff because I know absolutely nothing about super volcanoes. And my challenge, of course, is to not be alarmist. Right, right? of course. Like, I, I loathe that sort of alarmist science stuff. Yep. I, you got to talk about it practically. And, and there's a reason I brought it up at all, just because there's some interesting science going on in this space. But yeah, it's. I, I th do think we need to run down the fundamentals of what volcanoes and, and tectonics are all about in the first place. And then we can sort of get into these more extreme scenarios. Well, we'll do that in a minute. But first, we have this thing called Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> Hey man, what do you got? I have an article that I've been sitting on for uh, almost a year now. And uh, this is from iflscience.com. You can guess what the IFL stands for. You can guess what that stands for. <laughs> Enormous <laughs> hidden void discovered within the Great Pyramid of Giza using cosmic ray particles. And this is from November cool. of 2017. And let me just read this because it, it you know, uh, it, it's funny that volcanoes happen to be your topic. You didn't know about this. I didn't know about the volcanoes. And this is right. the next one in my list. So the story says, a technique normally used to uncover the plumbing of networks of volcanoes has made an altogether different discovery. That of a gigantic hidden void within the Great Pyramid of Giza one that is at least 4,500 years old. Tantalizingly, at this point in time, no one on Earth has any idea what the void actually is, who exactly built it, what its purpose was, or even how to access it. Also known as Khufu's Pyramid, named after the pharaoh that it was built for, it already contains a multitude of incredible spaces, including the king's chamber, the queen's chamber, and a gigantic passage leading to the royal burial chambers known as the Grand Gallery. This new area was found above the gallery. It's about 30 meters or 98 feet long, perhaps even longer. Discovered in 2016, the research team comprised largely of physicists, engineers, and archaeologists from Nagoya University and Paris's Heritage Innovation Preservation Institute, told journalists during a call that whatever it is, it's clearly very big and very important. We were very surprised to see such a big anomaly. Coordinating research, Mehdi Tayubi, the president and co-founder of HIP, explained. At the moment, we're not sure if it's horizontal or inclined, one structure, or several successive structures. What we are sure of is that it's there, it's impressive, and it was not expected nor predicted by any theory. At present, they're not willing to officially call it a chamber. And here's where the tech comes in. This breathtaking nature study is part of the Scan Pyramids Project, one that uses subatomic particles named muons, which we've talked about, yeah. to identify large spaces within an object. Similar to electrons, they're usually produced when cosmic rays slam into the atmosphere. If you place a detector on one side of an object, then blast muons through the object, you can see concealed voids within. The more muons that get through, the larger the void. So that's how Harry Potter did that stupid cloak trick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking no. <laughs> Blasting it with muons, man. There you go. He just had his portable muon generator. Anyway, it goes on with more interesting stuff. And, and you know, quite frankly, I haven't uh, looked for any kind of story about this after this particular story. So maybe they actually know more. I just checked their news feed and no, the last posting is about finding that that particular chamber. So, I mean, the, the, the challenge, of course, is that the Egyptian government is very protective of the pyramid. They don't want anyone taking it apart, which is why these non-destructive scans are, are popular right now. Yeah. But how are you going to find your way into that chamber? Because that pyramid has been gone over with a fine tooth comb, basically to find any gap. Yeah. So if there were any openings in the grand chamber, in the king's chamber, or any of the places that could possibly lead to that, they would have found that by now. So right. The fact that there's a, a another chamber 
means there probably really is no access to it or the access has been so well removed that they, they have found no trace of it. It's just very, very cool. It's so. interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And it is funny that it is the technology used to, to, to map magma chambers yep. because I am absolutely got to talk about magma chambers. So that's what I got. Who's talking to us, Richard? Grabbed a comment off of show 1548, which is the geek out we did back in May about life on other planets. And of course, there's the largest controversy on there is really about the naming of what a planet is. Right. But I'm not going to go there because there was another <laughs> comment uh, from Jason Brenner. He says, I'm curious about your thoughts about the humans versus robots debate for exploring and performing science in space. The hostile environments on and around Europa and Enceladus suggest that robotic missions are really the only viable choice. However, one of the issues you mentioned in the show was the incredibly long feedback cycle between one mission gathering data and then influencing the scientific build-out of the next mission. Right. For locations that are less hostile, would it be better served by having a human there who can make observations and adjust experiments on the fly? Hmm. Are humans still better at doing science in space? Or will robotics reach a point in the near future that allows for more flexibility with science than we can achieve now? Yeah. What do you think? Good question. I don't know. Well, I mean, I would argue that humans are always better at doing science because we have great senses for it. And because scientists are really powerful at looking for what most scientific discoveries look like, which is the sort of the, huh, that's weird. Not only that, but it, all science starts with a hunch, you know, like and you have to have imagination. I, classic quote from Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than uh, knowledge. And the whole idea there being you have to be able to imagine weird things in order to, uh, you know, think of them as a possible explanation that then needs to be discovered and proved. You know, the problem is never going to look like what you think, you know. Right. My best example would be Harrison Schmidt. The, of the 12 men that walked on the moon, only Harrison Schmidt was actually a trained geologist. Hmm. He had helped train the other astronauts to look for unusual rocks. But think about the advantage that he had. He already knew, because of his years of training as a geologist, what normal rocks look like. So, you can even pick out what the heck a weird rock would be. Right. You need imagination to think up potential weird rocks, all of those, again, derived from hypotheses. Right. But in the end, the most important rock found on the moon of all of those missions was found by Harrison Schmidt. Hmm. It was an unshocked piece of olivine that is one of the best proofs we have that there was volcanic activity on the moon after its formation. Yeah. So, without a doubt... A human set of senses and a human's ability to think about a problem and to look for unusual things provides an incredible advantage to doing and discovering meaningful science. Right. The downside is the tremendous expense Yeah. to keep a human alive up there. Could that rock that Harris and Schmidt have found been found by a robot? Possibly. And the robot would have had an advantage in the sense that for the cost of taking humans up there, you could have sent a dozen robots. Well, and, you know, robots can be driven remotely and they have cameras. And if the cameras are high res enough, you know, that that's potentially yeah, it's, it, doable. But all of Earth. those things are harder. And uh, in every sense, while it is an extension of our senses, it's a restricted extension. So, uh, all of that is harder. You know, one of the elements of the the moon gateway, this base they want to build in an orbit around the moon, is so that you could put scientists in orbit around the moon, which is easier than putting them on the surface of the moon. We right. already know how to do that with the space station right. and have them operate robots in much closer proximity yep. so they can afford to follow hunches and, and to explore in more detail and, and take more chances with a robot that is ultimately serviceable. Yep. You know, they, for better or worse, when you put a robot like Curiosity on Mars, you are incredibly cautious with it. Because there is no option to repair it. Sure. You don't want to take any chances with soft terrain. You know, in the end, Spirit got stranded in some soft sand and made, and eventually got at an angle where the solar panels couldn't be properly recharged. And that's how they lost Spirit. And we have a risk right now with the dust storm going on Mars of losing opportunity as well. Although, owe us nothing. Those rovers are supposed to last 90 days and opportunity is at 14 years. Yeah, right. But... <laughs> Without a doubt, the strength of humans on site is their much faster ability to react and to explore and to hypothesize and experiment. 
but it, at what in tremendous cost. It's just to consider, I love the prospect of sending a human onto the surface of Europa, but that means keeping them alive for a decade or more for right. a round trip. Right. And the radiation environment around Jupiter is no fooling. Like that's a hard problem too. Do I think ultimately we'd get more science value from it? That's a tougher problem because you think of the number of missions we could fly to Europa with robotics versus the number of missions for the same amount of money that we'd take one mission with humans. Right. Interesting. So that that's sort of the battle in my mind for that whole thing. It's just mm. that it's a cost thing. But the capability is really, you know, humans are always going to be better at this stuff. But, Jason, I really appreciate your comment. And a copy of Music to Code Buy is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code Buy, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com or via any of our social media because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code Buy. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We scan them for cavities. <laughs> good one <laughs> with our muon emitters yes my portable like muon emitter. emitter i can see through your clothes nice someday maybe someday maybe not maybe Who not wants to do hopefully that? not all right well let's actually talk about the fundamentals of volcanoes and how they okay. work well and it sort of ties into our last geek out the life on other planets as i did talk about how the earth has this very active core that is maintaining a, ma a massive magnetic field relative to its size right that uh, protects our atmosphere from being stripped by the solar wind one yep. of the consequences of that is that our crust of the planet is relatively unstable it cracks on a regular basis so they that molten core this material we call magma is moving around beneath the crust of the planet and it sometimes pools into areas forming what's called a magma chamber. Mm. And as that magma chamber builds in pressure, it presses against the crust until it causes cracks. Is that why I've been falling down a lot lately? Yeah, yeah. That, that, I think those, are, those may be cracks, but they're more in your head than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a, one of the reasons to bring this up now is that we've had a, a bunch of spectacular eruptions uh, and Kilauea in Hawaii is a is a fine example of that. I mean, right. Kilauea has been erupting since the 1980s. Hmm. Uh, but this past few months, it sort of stepped up its game. But it stepped up its game in a very non-violent way. Although it's been hard on the hundreds of homes it's destroyed, it hasn't been blasting huge amounts of gas into the air or being really explosive. Literally, fissures have opened up, dozens of fissures have opened up across the southern part of the Big Island. And lava, magma, until it leaves the fissure, in which case it becomes lava, has been pouring out. Right. So, you know, part of the understanding of volcanoes is recognizing why, you know, often people think of volcanoes as that great big cone. And yet here is this massive volcano in Kilauea and really not forming cones. And the reason for that is the nature of the composition of the lava involved. So, okay. so we've learned more about how this behaves. We've come to appreciate that there are several different lava compositions. And really, it comes down to their concentration of silica as to how they're going to behave. Mm. So the lava that you're seeing coming from Kilauea and the ones that you often see a lot, uh, whenever you see video of like the Atlantic rift. So in the middle of the Atlantic ocean, there's a crack right. that is literally forming new ground. And if you ever see video of that, you see lava sort of coming up in bubbles and, and freezing immediately. These are all mafic lavas. They're what they're considered low silica lavas, about 45 to 50% silica. Did you say mafic? Mafic, M-A-F-I-C, mafic. Literally. Okay. And so they're very low viscosity. They're, they're like, they're much more liquid. They run very hot. Hmm. And so they don't tend to build cones. They tend to just flow wherever they want to flow and they'll flow great distances. So the volcanoes they tend to make, we call shield volcanoes. And Kilauea is a shield volcano because it's a long, low, flat thing. Now, it's not to say that this lava isn't dangerous. It is quite dangerous. And one of the things that's happening in Kilauea is as that lava, besides destroying everything in its path, cars and farms and houses and so forth. When it reaches the ocean and cools abruptly, it shatters into a fine mist of, of glass and hydrochloric acid. 
Do you mean when the hot lava hits the water, it shatters? Yes, it hits the ocean. Yeah. Specifically, it's an interaction with the ocean that produces clouds of extremely fine glass and hydrochloric acid. Well, that could be dangerous if you're near that. Which, you know, we strongly recommended that you not be near there. Not only because if you breathe the hydrochloric acid, but you could actually get cut with the glass particles, right? Well, and that's, you know, part of the real thing about the biggest issue around volcanoes is this thing called pyroclastic flows, hmm. which are generally formed by the thicker lavas. So, felsic lavas, are, which are greater than 60% silica, are the thick... Uh, slow moving lavas. They don't, tra the lava doesn't travel very far, but it tends to harden abruptly and then build up pressure. Also, mm. the, the compound is good at holding on to the gases that are typically emitted by magma, the sulfur dioxides and other, uh, hydrocarbons that are quite toxic. Mm. And so this is where you get into more cone based or dome based volcanoes. So, uh, when we talk about sort of the famous, Famous cone volcano of North America, we talk about Mount St. Helens. Sure. So, that was the largest eruption in modern times uh, in North America. It's in uh, the southern part of the state of Washington and it yep. erupted in May of 1980. We were kids. We were kids. And yeah. I remember uh, the ash falling on our car in Connecticut. Wow. I, yeah. didn't, I didn't hear that. We certainly, being in Vancouver, we heard the explosion and uh, the ash didn't make it up here because we're sort of due north yeah. and even slightly west of it. But, you know, it, it covered a lot. And it also speaks a lot to how we understand volcanoes today, that the the St. Helens was a classic, what they call composite volcano or stratovolcano, in the sense that it had erupted over years, hundreds of thousands of years before, yeah. and it would use these denser, it had this denser lava involved in its magma chamber that would create explosions that would create very fine volcanic ash, which is really a kind of very sharp glass mm. that's been puffed with these gases and then layers of, of lava over and over again to build these big cones. So it's kind of layered. Is that what you mean by composite? It has lava and ash and lava and ash? Exactly. So there was lava at the site that flowed down, but but ash sort of spewed up in the air, right? Right. Well, the, the, when we talk about the specifics of the 1980 eruption, I mean, I'm talking yeah, about yeah. ash and lava that formed the, the volcano in the first place. Okay. And if you ever see pictures of St. Helens from before that eruption, it was quite a pretty volcano. Mm. Snow on the top, big dome. It was beautiful. Yeah. It's not so pretty anymore. Yeah, the top just blew right off it. It blew the whole side of the mountain out. And yeah. so, but... Vol we scientists had figured out that the volcano was getting ready to erupt because they were able to measure the changes in shape. So as the magma had been pressing against the the volcano, it had built up a lava dome, literally a growing bulge on the eastern side of St. Helens that wow. when it finally erupted, uh, blew apart and sent this huge clouds of ash high into the atmosphere as well as destroying Spirit Lake and blowing down miles and miles and miles of trees mm -hmm. and uh, and killing a number of people, even though it was a well-known eruption. How big was the bulge? Was it measured? It was. It's absolutely measurable. It's measurable in feet, not hundreds of feet. But, right. you know, one of the reasons that we're getting better and better at predicting volcanoes these days is that we've now got satellites that map the surface of the earth in close enough detail they can literally see just a few inches of movement that's so cool and so that's sort of your indicator that the magma is pressing and and building up pressure but it doesn't automatically mean an eruption either so right. uh so but I, I think it's important to understand that there's these distinctions between these lavas that ultimately lead to the kinds of eruptions you're going to have right and let's uh hold it right there while we hear this important message Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. All right, we're back. Carl Franklin, Richard Campbell talking about super volcanoes. Um, uh, something I know absolutely nothing about except what I've learned in the last 20 minutes. So I'm really, <laughs> really fascinated by this stuff. So, 
So what makes a super volcano a super volcano, not just a volcano? So the, the, there's a thing called the volcanic explosive index, and it works very much like the Richter scale for earthquakes. Okay. And so it lets us sort of judge, uh, what's significant in the earth, in, in the power of the volcano. There's a bunch of different factors. It's logarithmic like the Richter scale. So from going from one number to the next is really a tenfold increase in violence. Right. And so, but there is a zero level. So Kilauea is actually considered a, a VEI of zero. Huh. Not that it isn't destructive. It's just not an explosive eruption. Right. It's thrown less than 10,000 cubic meters of ejecta. Okay. Now, I mean, a cubic meter is not small, right? That's roughly three foot cubed. So 10,000 cubic meters, you know, it's 350,000 cubic feet. Right. That sounds like a lot. But when you get up to a St. Helens class, right? And St. Helens was a VEI of five. Okay. Okay. St. Helens threw slightly over a cubic kilometer of material into the atmosphere. Wow. Jeez. So that's pretty serious eruption, right? Like you're in the no fooling category then. And, but a very mad, I mean, it was not easy on the people it killed. It certainly wasn't easy on the places that it, that it destroyed. It did, did destroy a substantial piece of the Eastern Washington and put ash across a large area. Right. But ultimately are, you know, it's not a civilization ending thing to have a VEI-5 uh, volcano erupt. And they are relatively rare. It, we typically go, at any given time, there's 100 to 200 volcanoes erupting somewhere in the world. Most right. of them are, you know, zero ones and twos. Only every 10 or so years do we see something of, of a St. Helens power, or like a five. Right. Um, Pinatubo, which was erupted in 1991 in the Philippines, was a six. Okay. And those are roughly 100-year volcanoes. They're, they're quite a bit rarer. Uh, and Pinatubo is sort of famous because it threw enough sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere that it actually lowered the average planetary temperature by about half a degree Celsius. Huh. For a year. Wow. And it speaks to the concern as we start to get to larger and larger, more powerfully explosive volcanoes, is that the, the material they throw into the atmosphere will actually block the sun. Hmm. Um, let's talk about a VEI of seven. So the most recent known VEI of seven was a volcano called Tambora. Okay. And Tambora w erupted in 1815. Yeah. Now, the reason Tambora is sort of relevant is that this is, there's very much known history about this because it threw uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 square kilometers uh, or 100 square kilometers of material into the atmosphere. Wow. And 1816 is known as the year without a summer. The estimate is that the average planetary temperature dropped by four degrees. Okay. And so in the U.S., there was snow in June. The growing season dropped from 120 days to nearly 60 days, and starvation was widespread. Wow. Like it was, it was a tough year. Now, I mean, the good news is that the eruption ended relatively rapidly. Gradually, that sulfur dioxide does fall back out of the sky again, hmm. uh, in the form of acid rain. Right. And, uh, and so we recover. So a one lost growing season or damaged growing season is not sort of the end of the world, but it was right. enough to fundamentally change weather for a year. And that speaks to when we start talking about VEIs of eight which is the super volcano class. Mm. Uh, we are now talking about over a thousand square, a thousand cubic kilometers of material being thrown into the atmosphere. Mm. So 10 times more powerful than a tambor eruption. I get it. So the last super volcano class, there's about, they, they figure there's about 20 super volcanoes in the world. Okay. Now, the reason you don't know about them really is that they don't look like volcanoes. Really? But they don't have cones. Are you talking about like Yellowstone? Yellowstone is a super volcano. Yeah. Right? So the question is, well, why? Why? I mean, why doesn't it look like a volcano? Hmm. The magma chamber is so large that it can't build a cone. When a super volcano erupts, 
what actually happens is, is the magma chamber expands and starts putting pressure on the ground above it. The ground cla- cracks and collapses into the magma chamber. And so mm. we don't call super volcanoes, you know, cone volcanoes per se. We call them caldera because they're basically a dent in the ground where the magma chamber basically opened up and the ground fell into it and then it erupted violently. Now, yellow, you mentioned Yellowstone, which is one of the most famous one. It certainly is a major talking point of, uh, of this whole show. Yeah. But the magma, the caldera of Yellowstone is about 50 miles one way, 25 miles the other. Wow. So it's just big. Huge. It's, just, it's hard to get your head around how big we're talking. Dozens of miles across. Yeah. So the last super volcano or super eruption to occur actually occurred in New Zealand mm. about 27,000 years ago. I was going to say, not your house. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> before me, my time. Um, Taupo is a big crater lake in the center of the North Island. It's okay. beautiful, actually, lovely spot. But it's also full of hot springs and, and geysers, the kind of things that remind you there's a big old magma chamber below that whole thing. <laughs> and 20, 27,000 years ago, it erupted just barely enough to cl- classify it as a VEI of eight. It threw about 1,100 cubic kilometers of ejecta. I feel sorry for the Neanderthals that were bathing in that hot spring. Uh, well, it's funny you should bring up Neanderthals. So I'm going to talk about a couple of other eruptions. Uh-huh. But in the case of the Taupo eruption, the reason they know it occurred is that when you dig down into the soils of the North Island, there is a 200 meter thick layer of ash. That's 660 feet if you're non-metric. Good God. So the entire island was buried in ash the the height of 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 a skyscraper yeah and they found evidence of that ash on the chatham islands better part of a meter of it on the chatham islands which are a thousand kilometers away Mm. so this is uh, these are catastrophically vast explosions and they do cool the entire planet when they happen Mm. well richard yeah buddy guess what time it is now hey it must be that happy time again Yeah, it's time to blow the top off this intelligent discussion with a hot smoking lava of silica silliness. (laughs) That's the best I could come up with. I'm trying to pay attention, you you know, I can't really, I can't really just duck out. Yeah, I don't get to go chat with a guest while you write a joke in in a geek out. (laughs) That's right, I have to do it while I'm listening, yeah. Yeah. It's actually time to give away a $200 Amazon gift card to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club, compliments of Progress Telerik. But first, let me tell you about Conversational UI from Progress Telerik and Kendo UI. Conversational UI are chatbot framework agnostic user interface controls and components that enable .NET and JavaScript developers to create modern conversational chatbot experiences in their web, mobile, and desktop applications. The industry's first package set of user interface components built specifically for chatbots is available as part of the company's Telerik ASP.NET AJAX, ASP.NET MVC, ASP.NET Core, WinForms, WPF, Xamarin products, and Kendo UI for jQuery, Angular, Vue, React, PHP, and JSP libraries. By implementing key UI design features like calendars, date pickers, list views, and others that are included in the tool sets, developers will be able to improve chatbot conversation through visual elements that enhance the natural flow of conversation. For more information, visit Telerik.com slash conversational UI. All right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Michael Brennan. Congratulations, Michael. Yeah. Golf clap for you, sir. Golf clap for Michael Brennan. He just won a $200 Amazon gift card from Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we'd like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of the fan club. But you got to sign up if you want to win. So, I got a question. All right, buddy. 
the you know the Pompeii is like the classic example people say of volcanoes really killing like an entire civilization yep, an entire volcano. town yeah yeah and uh from what i understand it wasn't the lava flow that killed everybody but it was the resulting fire well it was the pyroclastic flows so i i probably should have talked about this up front because and there's been a recent major pyroclastic eruption in guatemala and the fuego volcano okay and it, and and saint helens was a, a pyroclast as well so mm. what happened in pompeii is that uh, Vesuvius erupted with a pyroclastic flow. And so this denser lava surges up, falls back down, surges up, falls back down. It's a series of earthquakes. And then there's an explosion as the gas finally reaches critical pressure and blows okay. out. And it, it blows the lava into very fine ash. So this is gas bubbles. It makes very sharp, fine ash that is deadly to your lungs. And it right. moves at incredible speed. It, in some cases, clocked at more than 200 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, carrying rocks and debris with it. And very hot. A thousand degrees Celsius. So that's the first way people died. <laughs> so, yeah, the, I mean, the shock wave will kill, but when the ash arrives, it will, it, you'll probably suffocate first. So, mm. you don't get time to burn to death. Mm. Although, there have been evidences in post pyroclastic flow events where they found people whose heads have exploded because their brains basically boiled. Oh. Because it's so hot. Hey, this is a family show. That's disgusting. Yeah, it's not, this is not, a pre you do not want to die this way. No. This is fairly horrible. Um, if it hits snow and ice, it cre creates these mud flows that are, again, hot and in intensely dangerous. Mm. So, what happened in Pompeii is the superheated ash felt, and yes, there was a huge fire, but first it suffocated everyone. Right. So, you, you, ra you, you, you fall down because you're suffocating, and then you're pretty much incinerated. Yeah. Um, but it happens quickly. And what's bizarre about Pompeii, if you ever get a chance to tour the place, is the that- The preservation as, of the bodies. Yeah. The, yeah. Well, the sh the bodies aren't in there. They burned up. The right. shape of the bodies is preserved. Yeah. yeah. Um, because the ash densifies quite quickly and, it, and it's sticky. It's sharp. So, mm. it tends to hold its shape. And then when the rain comes, which is almost inevitable uh, shortly after an eruption, all that ash being thrown in the high atmosphere mm. actually pulls the water out of the atmosphere. It also creates lightning um, to light more fires. Yeah. It will hold its forms. Mm -hmm. uh, and just this past June, the the volcano of fire, uh, Volcano de Fuego in, in Guatemala, this is a, a composite volcano that's been erupting on and off for ages. And in fact, it's had steady levels of eruption since 2002, which I think is one of the reasons that the locals kind of got complacent. They yeah, were they, constantly they, warned. They walk it. And I, know, I know somebody who hikes it. Yeah, sure. No, it's, yeah. it's been around for a long time. And there are active volcanoes all through Central America. I've been to Arenal in, in Costa Rica. But this time in June this year, there was a, a very powerful eruption, uh, as powerful as the one from 1974. Mm. And a pyroclastic floor came screaming down an unexpected direction and buried a set of villages, killed at least 100 people yeah. and many more injured. Yeah. And it just happened so quickly. You know, it's it's hard to to react to it, especially when you're used to the mountain rumbling and blowing ash right. periodically and so forth. You just mm. don't know when the big eruption is going to come. Mm. So it's you know, humans have always lived with it, and it's funny that you bring up uh, Vesuvius because right on the other side of the Bay of Naples, on the other side of Naples, is a super volcano hmm. uh, by the name of uh, Campi Flegleri, which is the next last super volcano to erupt. It erupted 39,000 years ago in a thing called the Campion Ignimbrite eruption. Wow. And it threw, it wasn't quite super volcano class, this particular eruption, mm. but the timing of it's really interesting for uh, archaeologists because it's around the time that the Neanderthal disappear. Wow. So, when we talk about these kind of extinction events, it's usually because a species is already under pressure. And the yeah. Neanderthals were struggling against the, the Homo sapiens, it's presumed. You know, there's some evidence that they conflicted and also interbred. Right. Uh, but this particular eruption was large enough. They have evidence of it. So, this is the northern part of Italy. They have evidence of ash that went all the way across the Mediterranean, Europe, all the way to Russia. Mm. Veg huge amounts of vegetation wiped out. Temperatures dropped by several degrees mm. for at least a year, if not two. And 
Yeah, it seems like that probably took Neanderthals out. All of humanity was very nearly wiped out by a super volcano about mm. 75,000 years ago, which was one of the largest super volcano eruptions we've ever determined mm. called the Toba eruption, which is yeah. the, the actual caldera is in Sumatra, which is part of Indonesia. Right. And the guess is that 3,000 3, cubic kilometers of material was thrown up. That was what, 75,000 years ago? So 75,000 years ago. And that's where they, the, you know, the estimate from uh, paleontologists is that the human population may have dropped down to maybe 10,000 people total. That is incredible. Yeah. That wow. Is, it was a close call is what it was. <laughs> so you so. think we're more likely to be wiped out as a species by an asteroid or a volcano? Well, and it's interesting you should bring that up because... Uh, one of the reasons to rate this particular show is that there is a NASA group called the Advisory Council on Planetary Defense, and you typically think of them as focused on asteroids and comet impacts. That sounds like a superhero coalition, doesn't it? It, it does. Right? <laughs> yeah, like actually, the Avengers, it is. Only scientists, not <laughs> Robert Downey Jr. <laughs> Uh, but they apparently have put together a paper where they show that the Yellowstone caldera represents a substantial threat to humanity. Wow. So, uh, curiously, of the seven active uh, uh, supervolcano caldera, three of them are in the U.S. Jeez. The Vallis caldera is in New Mexico. There's the Long Valley caldera in California. And the big whopper, of course, is Yellowstone. The Yellowstone Lava Creek? Is that the one or the Huckleberry Ridge? I'm looking at a chart. Well, Huckleberry Ridge was w was one of the eruptions. So, Yellowstone seems to be going off roughly every 600,000 years, give or take 100,000 years. <laughs> okay. Um, so, there's been three super eruptions in the past 2.1 million years. So, if you do the math, you'll figure out that we're about 600,000 years since the last one. Mm. Uh it, the caldera obviously is massive. If you talk about the Huckleberry Ridge tuff eruption, this is the first one that was found by geologists where they sort of figured out that this is an eruption actually from Yellowstone. And it covered, it, it laid down a circle of ash from Manitoba in Canada down into Mexico and from California to Illinois. Jeez. So two thirds of continental U.S. covered in ash. But it was a couple million years ago, right? Uh, this was a couple million years ago, right? Mm -hmm. So, if you, know, you talk about the muon detectors, we've used the size monitors and so forth, they have mapped the Yellowstone caldera in great detail. And one of the things they've realized is that Yellowstone moves up and down on a routine basis. Different parts of the caldera area mm. raise and lower by more than a foot Yeah, in a year. Wow. It's not that unusual. That That... Magma chamber is quite active, although curiously, because they have mapped it in great detail, there are two magma chambers. They call them the upper and the lower. So it's mm. quite a complex structure. Wow. And the best ma the best analysis they have so far is that in order to have an eruption, you have to have a certain amount of liquid magma in the chamber. Remember that as the magma moves from the inner parts of the planet out to the outer parts of the planet, it tends to harden and it needs right. surges of heat to soften. And so the current understanding is that magma chambers need to be mostly liquid magma, more than 50%. Yeah. And depending on whose math you're looking at right now, that chamber is between 10 and 20%. Although in 2003, it may have bumped up quite a bit higher. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that was the time when the, the steamboat geyser, which is a geyser that erupts every dozen years or so, erupted three times in a month. Wow. Um, so all these things are kind of scary, right? They're, they're sort of signals. And if there, if we were to see steady rising, if the ground mm. just kept going up, that right. would be an indicator of Yellowstone potentially erupting. Wow. And doing the math, they, they've sort of worked through what an eruption would look like. So, obviously, we would start evacuations. They figure mm. at least a 60-mile radius would be an immediate kill zone. Right. So, that's Jackson Hole and a lot of the village, towns in that area would immediately erupt it. Uh, within a 200-mile radius, you would be all on warning. Um, there are particular classes of earthquakes that now we recognize as the motion of magma under the ground that represents an impending eruption. Mm. So there are short-term measurements. Logically, if it followed the standard pattern of a large-scale caldera eruption, and nobody knows for sure that this is exactly what would happen, but this mm. is the sort of typical pattern, 
you would have an expanding magma uh, chamber that would press on the ground and then it would have a collapse probably somewhere between 30 and 50 miles across huh. that then would throw up a tremendous ash cloud. Uh, the pyroclastic flow would probably go at at least 60 miles in all directions, moving 200 plus miles an hour and 1,000 degrees Celsius. So it will incinerate everything. Wow. Within a day, the ash would reach Denver. Within a week, there'd be a meter of ash on the ground in Denver. Wow. The cloud would hit at least half of the U.S. And well, again, volcanic ash is really nasty stuff. We call it ash so you think, you know, burnt wood, but it's right. not. It's actually very fine fragments of volcanic glass, mm. and it lacerates lungs, and yeah. it uh, impedes your ability to breathe, and cre- and it's poisonous. Right. So it will if it is also much denser than snow. So it should it, when it rains. If you still have ash, it's about three times denser than snow. So you still have ash on structures. It will right. collapse roofs, right? And you know, damage buildings like that is. It's it's not a small thing for when, when all of these things get together. So you are talking a huge amount of the the country immediately within days damaged. But then it is the nuclear winter essentially, or the volcanic winter. And to, you know, one of the questions is how long does the eruption actually last for? Because mm. if it's a your typical one-time style eruptions that most composite style vol- eruptions look like, they they stop, and then within a year or so, most of the ash will fall out of the atmosphere. Mm. But we've never seen a super volcano eruption in person, and there's mm. some evidence that they may go on for years. And yeah, if they do. Know then you're going to have constant winter for years and food will become the crisis without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. So wow. ready for the interesting news on this. I mentioned the, the council of planetary defense. Da, da, da. Yes. So, and a fellow by the name of Brian Wilcox, who's uh, works for the jet propulsion laboratory was a member of that. Okay. And he's one of the ones who sort of brought up the fact that super volcanoes appear to be a larger threat statistically than asteroids are. And understanding that these gigantic magma chambers, and admittedly in supervolcanoes, they are very, very large, need a certain amount of liquid magma to actually cause an eruption, there's an argument that we could cool them. Now, the planet cools the Yellowstone caldera all of the time. That's what geysers are. Geysers are water that leaks down into the ground, gets heated by the, the... the rock down there above the magma chamber and then blasts back up at boiling temperatures where it's cooled by the atmosphere, falls back down and cools it down again. So they figure about 60% of the heat from that magma chamber leaks into the atmosphere in the form of that water cycle and general radiation uh, uh, circulation effects. So NASA's proposal would be to bore holes around the edge of the magma chamber and pump water down to keep it solid enough that it cannot erupt. It's kind of like a pressure release valve. Well, think of it more like geothermal power, because you're going to superheat that water. It's going to come flying back up those pipes, and you could spin turbines with it. Wow, nice. So, their their estimate is that for about $3.5 billion, they could build a, a couple of gigawatt power plants at, at generating electricity, quite low cost, by the way. So... You don't want to just pump water into the caldera. It's marginally effective, and it's a waste of water. It would make more sense to build geothermal power plants. So building structures at the edge of the caldera, drilling down as much as 10 kilometers around the edges of the the magma chamber, and then pumping water down to it, which will, of course, be superheated, come back up, spin turbines, and you can make electricity from it. And then you're also reusing the water, so you don't waste any water that way, and you can keep repumping it, repumping it. So it, it really is a strategy to manage that caldera, to keep it hardened enough that it just doesn't become a good eruption point. Well, it sounds like a win-win to me, if it works. Now, you're going to have some concerns about this, right? I mean, first off, that is a national park. So, building power plants in it is going to upset a certain number of people. Sure, but they're going to save humanity. (laughs) Yeah, that that, that is an argument. And you are going to make electricity from it, although we don't have a lot of need for electricity there. Right. Uh, But we can distribute it further afield if we want, right? That's certainly an option. Well, electricity is funny because you can convert that into more portable storage forms of energy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Now, I never trust NASA's cost estimates because 
Because <laughs> the you shuttle. Know, they started out calling the <laughs> James Webb Space Telescope a billion dollar telescope and they spent eight on it. Yeah. Um, there is a question about the potential risk that the, and it's interesting to think in terms of you are going to drill close to a magma chamber. Mm. You might actually have a blowout of pressure that could create other problems. Right. Uh, you also, every time you send water down that pipe, you are going to shock the rock. It, yeah. You know, you think about what's going on with fracking. Sure. This is a kind of fracking behavior and it's going to cause potential earthquakes. It's a non zero chance that it could cause some kind of eruption. A super volcano eruption? Probably not. Yeah. But the bigger thing here, it, it, depending on which scientists you look at, they say we can't possibly supply enough heat release to actually move the needle meaningfully. Hmm. That we may, it, it may not be a couple of power plants, it may be hundreds. Yeah. That we would need to actually, and that's still a t tremendous amount of water and a tremendous amount of work. Well, you know what? It, you know, modern engineering could come up with a solution that wasn't power plants necessarily but more distribution uh, you know set some engineers on that problem but then this is the thing that bothers me carl is like if this speaks to a real world problem we may have another hundred thousand years before yellowstone erupts sure and we may have five right but why wouldn't we at least do the experiments to start to understand this? Exactly. I've been fascinated at all of the science around things like fracking and geothermal just from a point of view of could we learn to mitigate the tensions that cause earthquakes mm. and manage volcanoes? Yeah. You know, we, we, ma we manipulate our environment all of the time. We right. just tend to not actually study the consequences particularly well, and often they're negative. Mm. Here is a case where we could be doing something that have a really huge, potentially positive effect for all of us. Right. And wouldn't it be great if the coalition of planetary protection saved the day? That'd be a movie, well, at least. At Spielberg. least a movie. Let's call Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> I would be I would be keener to actually build up a set of science that would allow us to help people all over the world not fear volcanoes and yeah, earthquakes. I agree. And if we could happen to make it, you know, revenue neutral at least as ways to create non-polluting power, so much the better. So much just, the better. It's frustrating to me that we aren't having this debate, that we are having other debates that seem very self-inflicted. Yeah. rather than actual problems that matter to humanity. Mm. That's a good one, Richard. You like the show? Yeah, great. Great discussion. All right. And, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up over a, over a glass of scotch somewhere, I'm sure. I'm sure. And love to talk to the listeners. You know, Write a comment on the site. Send us some messages. Facebook, Google+, Twitter, all of those things. This is not a, a simple topic. Mm. And it has some, let's say, moral perils to it as well. Yeah, but uh, I'm uh, I'm keen to have that conversation, and so am I. Good stuff, Richard. Thank you, buddy. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a